we go. Excellent. Well, welcome. We are pleased this, this morning to present on the Bracing Bolt programs. This is our new city introduction. So when we open registration, we are staying in zip codes that we started in and we're bringing in new zip codes. And so we provide this webinar to introduce cities to the programs and um, I'll start with some technical information, information about the California Earthquake Authority, and then I'll turn it over to my colleague. So I am Janiel Maffei. I am the Chief Mitigation Officer for the California Earthquake Authority, and I um, am a structural engineer. So happy to, to provide a little bit about the technical behind the program. First and foremost, we'd like to introduce you to the California Earthquake Authority. When we started the program in 2013, we found it was a little difficult for people to understand who is this group and what are they giving? They're giving money away. And and um, and so we really like our, our cities that are joining us to understand who we are so that they can, you know, ask, answer questions um, about the program. And so the California Earthquake Authorities, uh, uh, was created after the Northridge earthquake, but to really understand why it was created, you go back to 1984 to when the state legislature created the California Mandatory Offer Law. So they passed this legislation where they, they made earthquake insurance a separate policy from a traditional homeowner's earth insurance policy. And um, so that's not part of our, our policies that we all have on our homes, but it's excluded and a company that writes policies in the state of California must offer it to homeowners who are purchasing their policies. So at the point of sale, they need to offer earthquake insurance. The homeowner is not obligated to purchase it, um, but it is offered. And so at the time of the Northridge earthquake, there was a tremendous amount of, of earthquake insurance from among single family homeowners. And along came this uh, very large, actually it was a six point seven, I think by the time um, that they actually checked all the size, the seismometers, $40 billion worth of damage, half of that residential and half of that insured. So modeling was was not quite what, what it is today in terms of modeling risk and the insurance companies really had, had not collected sufficient payout funds and they lost their shirts and they were going to stop writing insurance policies in the state of California. That is an insurance catastrophe and a mortgage catastrophe. And so the state legislature stepped in and created this unique instrumentality of the state called the California Earthquake Authority or CEA. We're publicly managed. We report to three elected officials, the governor, insurance commissioner and state treasurer and two non-voting members sit on our board that, representing the speaker of the assembly and the Senate rules chair. So publicly managed, we operate under public meeting laws. We our procurement is open um, as is to an agency, but we're not an agency. And so the difference here is that our uh, financing is is private. So we provide our insurance policy through over 25 participating insurers and money came from each of those participating insurers when they joined us, as well as we collect, of course, the premiums from policyholders. Our mission is to educate, mitigate, and insure. So educate, we would like homeowners to be as, as educated as possible to their risk, which includes the hazard, for example, where their house is located, and vulnerability, you know, the, the age of the house, the configuration of the house, just how damageable is it. Mitigate was a charge from, from day one for the CEA, and uh, it is the program that I manage within the CEA. We put aside 5% of investment income into a loss mitigation fund that, that funds our mitigation efforts. And then we leverage that money with either state or federal funding as, as we can um, obtain that funding. And then of course, Insure is our primary business. We're the largest provider of residential earthquake insurance to single family dwellings um, in California. And so educate, mitigate, and insure. So in order to do the mitigation program, we created the California Residential Mitigation Program, CRMP. So it's, it's somewhat separate from the CEA and it's jointly managed by the CEA and the Governor's Office of Emergency Services. So that's the state's FEMA really. 
And so uh, they are an agency. So we get a little bit of that agency status with their um, participation. We manage it through a joint powers agreement and there's a, a separate board that has both CEA and Cal OES uh, board members on it. CRMP was, was created to offer retrofit incentives and EBB or Earthquake Brace and Bold is our first program to promote code compliant retrofit. And I will describe why code compliant is such an important piece of what we do. We started with this particular vulnerability because we estimate there are more than a million homes in areas of high hazard with this cripple wall or crawl space and lack of anchorage uh, vulnerability. And so that is you know, a sizable challenge and um, we've come a long way to try and, and um, to meet that challenge. Now we're battling what we call the legacy of the voluntary retrofit in that, you know, for decades, California contractors and homeowners have been attempting to mitigate this, trying to anchor their houses to the foundations. Um, some plan sets were developed after the Northridge earthquake, but the reality is that because this retrofit is voluntary, uh, a building department really didn't have a lot of um, opportunity to uh, kind of correct, uh, a, let's say a retrofit that wasn't being done properly because uh, as long as you didn't make the house worse, a homeowner's really allowed to go in and put um, in their crawl space, you know, kind of a partial retrofit. But what they did is they studied uh, in both Northern and Southern California existing retrofits and found about 80% of them were not done properly. And so the, the need for a, a, you know, a very specific code compliant retrofit and one that was adopted into the existing building code was necessary. So the CEA was actually instrumental in um, having HCD upload and, and adopt this chapter A3 into the California existing building code in 2010. And this is what we require the retrofit to, to be in conformance with for EBB, for the Brace and Bolt programs. Now it's a prescriptive provision which means that it can be utilized by contractors and owner builders uh, without a specific engineer design for the house. It's essentially pre-engineered and it is just attacking one particular vulnerability. This is not making the house completely seismically code compliant, but rather we're making the crawl space code compliant with prescriptive provisions for just the sill plate anchorage and the strengthening of those cripple or crawl space walls. Now, there are two plan sets available in, in uh, California, the LA standard plan set and plan set A. LA standard plan set is traditionally used in North, Southern California, plan set A in Northern California. And the authors of these two plan sets consider them to be in conformance with uh, chapter A3. And so we accept them as construction documents. And of course, they, they require you to create a, a house specific plan and then cut the sections from the plan sets right on that uh, individualized plan. And um, obviously the, as construction documents, they would be submitted to the building department. The retrofit is really very basic. We're introducing new anchor bolts uh, when you can get in there with a roto hammer from the top. And the idea is to put in blocking so that you have a nice flush surface at the bottom of that cripple wall in order to nail the, the plywood. So the anchor bolt is going in through that blocking down into the concrete. Or when there isn't enough room for you to come in from the top, for example, in this picture, we're showing a stem wall condition where the wood floor sits directly on the mud sill on the concrete foundation. These foundation plates, these are proprietary, can be screwed into the mud sill and then bolted into the concrete. So these foundation plates can also be made out of plate steel. The nice thing about the proprietary ones is they allow for um, the mud sill to be, uh, no shimming is required. Uh, they can kind of tilt in there and grab that mud sill for the screws. Plywood sheathing then goes on and this picture is showing those cripple wall or crawl space walls along that, the uh, perimeter of the crawl space. You can also see the existing uh, horizontal sheathing on the outside. So that's why we're putting the plywood in is, is those elements that created the exterior finishes just don't have the stiffness or strength to keep that house on its foundation. So on the right, we see the plywood sheathing going from the bottom of the mud sill to the top of the, the two double top plates. What we're missing in that picture are the vent holes that are required and um, the mesh that can go on the back of those vent holes. Now we are creating shear walls. So the plywood nailing is, is critical 
to the performance of these plywood shear walls. And so uh, the training that we have on our website for contractors to be on our directory stresses that not to overdrive nails and to add nails when you've overdriven or misplaced the nail, no shiners, maintain that 3 8 inch minimum distance from the center of the nail to the edge of the sheathing. And um, of course, we have the size and spacing of the nailing in those plan sets and in chapter A3. Finally, the last step is to provide framing clips between the floor, in this case, it's shown on a rim joist or blocking to that top plate of the, the cripple wall. And so we have a load path now holding the floor to the either the mud sill or the cripple wall, stiffening that cripple wall and then connecting that mud sill to the foundation. And all of those pieces are essential. Um, and so that was one of the things they found in the studies of the inadequate retrofits is that they were leaving out pieces or perhaps putting in less anchor bolts or less plywood. And so this, these are the steps to that complete retrofit. Now, the, this voluntary retrofit legacy we talk about, um, none of the work is done on the interior of the crawl space. And so what we, we found in the beginning of the program is a lot of contractors felt that, you know, they were, they were supposed to put a lot of different, um, essentially hardware on the interior posts and piers. Now, if there's a post that needs to be realigned or replaced because of damage on the left, you'll see a perfectly adequate installation of one of those posts. On the right, you see a hole down out in the middle holding on to who heaven knows what it goes down into. So none of the work that qualifies for A3 or the plan sets is done at the interior of the crawl space. It is all done around the perimeter. And so, um, when we see work like this in the pictures, we'll, we're very quick to point out to the contractor or homeowner that we need to see the work that's around the perimeter and that there really is no work required in EBB or BB at the interior of a crawl space. So to summarize the qualifying retrofit, it's new anchors, either expansive or adhesive anchors or an approved foundation plate. It is plywood or OSB sheathing on the interior we'd like to, to stress interior we've had very few applications on the exterior and um, because of FEMA requirements for historical and um, energy we really uh, stress that it really should be done on the interior you're not touching that uh, the historic nature of the house nor are you touching the um, the kind of water or build, building envelope so um, we do see the, the not the majority but it's the rare exception that we've seen this on the exterior. And then, as I said, those framing clips between the uh, floor and cripple wall or mud sill. Now, uh, an engineered retrofit is allowed by our program as it is allowed by Chapter A3. And in fact, it's required for some certain conditions, which is when the cripple wall is greater than four feet tall or when you have an unusual perimeter with perhaps a lot of openings um, then an engineered retrofit is both required and accepted by the, the earthquake brace and bolt program. Uh, and uh, engineered design, we will ask the engineer to send us a letter stating that the work is in accordance with A3. They are allowed by Chapter A3 to use 75% of code base shear. Now we, we do, uh, it is our practice not to uh, tell building <laughs> officials or building departments how to do their job. We, we absolutely defer to the building department for technical interpretation of the code, but we do pass along best practices. And here's something that the authors of, of chapter A3 um, were intending. And I would say all building departments that we're working with currently uh, do this, which is when you have a house that has some slab on grade rooms, uh, and what we find commonly is that the attached garage would have a slab on grade or maybe a, a sunken living room or family room or an, or an addition um, that EBB and chapter A3 are allowed within the crawl space or crawl spaces of the house. So when you have a house that has some slab on grade, some crawl space, the idea here is to go in and utilize this retrofit for the crawl space area. You're, you're not touching any other space. And for example, you're not meeting the requirements of retrofitting a soft story with a large garage door opening. We're addressing just this one vulnerability. So chapter A3 in the plan set allow for notches in the sheathing for anchor bolt inspection. So, um, you know, building departments that are going out and looking at under the houses as, as um, to do the due diligence on the permitting process. 
can see those anchor bolts uh, through the vent holes so that you don't have to make two uh, inspections of a house. We're also passing along that the Structural Engineers Association of California's existing building committee did create and, and publish a commentary when Chapter A3 was adopted that recommends that anchor testing is not required. The anchor bolts are in shear, they're not in tension. Now, if you have a, an engineered design that has hold downs, then those would require the, the pull testing that's required of any you know, adhesive anchor that's going into existing concrete. Um, but the, the shear anchor bolts are really not required to be tested, and we currently do not have any building departments that are requiring testing. So I'm gonna turn it over to, to Mark um, now, but I, I did wanna just reiterate that um, we really appreciate uh, you joining us today, and we consider the building departments in the cities that we have our, our brace and bolt programs in to be partners. Obviously, the permit process is, is essential. Uh, we do have a, a special inspection where we send people out uh, to, to, to look throughout the, the state at um, you know, a small percentage of our work. Um, we, we're distressed when we hear that uh, an inspector came out, didn't climb under the house, or there was no inspection process so um, Mark will reiterate this, that we really do um, look hard at that and we send twining out to see if the work's been done appropriately. We will remove contractors from the list if we find that they're not doing the work properly. And we do reserve the right to remove the program from a city if we feel that um, there, there are no inspections going on. So we look forward to working with you and I'll now turn it over to our customer service manager, Mark Grissom, who will tell you about the program and how we interface with the building department. Thank you. Janiel, um, as she mentioned, my name is Mark Grissom. I'm the customer service manager for Earthquake Brace and Bolt and CEA Brace and Bolt. Um, both programs uh, here, as far as a building department is concerned, uh, are virtually identical. Uh, really, uh, what we require from the building department uh, for both programs is the same. It's just how homeowners or contractors uh, deal with it on their end can vary uh, for each one of those programs. Uh, I'm going to go over uh, both of them uh, for you here. Uh, Either one or both could be in your city. Uh, it could be either one. Earthquake Brace and Bolt might be there, but not CEA Brace and Bolt, or vice versa, or you could have both. Uh, this is just to give you an idea of um, the comparison of the two programs. Uh, previously, CEA Brace and Bolt used to be uh, the homes allowed in were pre-1940, and we've expanded the program now, so it's pre-1980, same as Earthquake, Brace and Bolt. They're both uh, raised foundation uh, and wood framed houses. The eligibility for homeowners is uh, a little different uh, for the programs. For CEA, Brace and Bolt, uh, you have to be a policy holder, CEA policy holder. Uh, and you had to have had a uh, premium increase in 2019 of 20% or more, and that group of people was uh, invited in to the CEA Brace and Bolt program. For Earthquake Brace and Bolt, we have select zip codes that we have uh, chosen throughout um, the state. Uh, we started with four in uh, the pilot program in 2013. And now we've expanded to over um, 350 for the 2020 program. Uh, they're uh, in just sort of a high level uh, to give you an idea of what it is, is uh, the way the, the zip codes are chosen has to do with the zip code being uh, close to a high hazard fault. Uh, as determined by the USGS uh, hazard map, and then having a high percentage of pre-1940 homes within that zip code. Uh, and then typically, once a, a city, like one of those high uh, hazard zip codes, 
in a particular city falls in, then we bring in all of the zip codes within that city, and then we keep expanding. We've so far been able to, with the, the funding that we've gotten, continue to expand. We haven't pulled out of any cities where we've been previously, uh, and we just continue to expand every year. As a matter of fact, this year for 2020, uh, we expanded by nearly 100 zip codes uh, for Earthquake Brace and Bolt. Earthquake Brace and Bolt, the selection process for who gets to participate once registration has happened uh, is a random selection. So uh, the registration will take place uh, over 30 days. At the end of that time, we will then do a random selection uh, within those zip codes and we will select a group to participate. The other group will be placed on a wait list. And then as space becomes available, we'll move people in from the wait list. For CEA Brace and Bolt, uh, that entire group of, of policyholders who had premium increases uh, of 20% or greater were invited in. So really all that's needed from them is to go to the CEA Brace and Bolt website, uh, put in some information about their their home, um, the address, et cetera, uh, and then create their dashboard. Once they've done that, they're accepted in and they can sort of begin the process. There's no random selection for them. Technically, they've already been selected. There are a couple of requirements. Uh, this year for Earthquake Brace and Bolt, the funding comes from FEMA. And because it does, FEMA has a couple of requirements uh, for homeowners that our CEA Brace and Bolt program being funded from CEA uh, itself doesn't have. Uh, we have a contractor directory where contractors have to take a, a training, a FEMA training, and they have to take a quiz. They have to pass that in order to be able to be added onto our directory. And one of FEMA's requirements is that homeowners who participate in the Earthquake Brace and Bolt program have to choose a contractor off of that directory. For Earthquake or for CEA Brace and Bolt, that isn't the case. If you happen to know a contractor who uh, you feel would do a great job for this, but uh, they don't happen to be on our directory, uh, you could still use them for CEA Brace and Bolt. Uh, if you so chose, uh, we would ask that, uh, that anybody who does that suggest to them that they be placed on a directory, uh, the more contractors we can get on there for people to have access to, the better. Uh, for Earthquake Price and Bolt, there's also a bid requirement. If the bid, the initial bid for the work happens to be over $10,000, then a second bid is required. Uh, if the first bid it was under $10,000, then you, there's no second bid requirement. But if it is over 10, then uh, per FEMA's request, another it is required. For CEA Brace and Bolt, that isn't a requirement, no matter what the, the bid is. I mean, obviously, we suggest that you get as many bids as you can. Uh, it's the best way to ensure you get a reasonable price for the retrofit, but there's no requirement for that. The grant incentive for both programs is the same. It's $3,000 uh, for either program. And uh, there is a hazard reduction discount for your CEA policy if you get a retrofit through either program. So it's uh, possible you could be a CEA policy holder, uh, but not have been part of that group that had a 20% premium increase. Um, and if that's the case and you've, you were lucky enough to be in a zip code and get chosen for the Earthquake Brace and Bolt program and you go through the whole thing, uh, the, the potential discount is the same for either one because ultimately the retrofit is the same for either program. The funding source for Earthquake Brace and Bolt, uh, it can vary somewhat. Uh, like I said, for 2020, we uh, were able to obtain FEMA grants, and so that's what's funding our program for 2020. Uh, and we will continue to try to get uh, funding wherever we can and get a, additional FEMA funding for subsequent years if we can. But we do also have a loss mitigation fund, which is what we had been using for the program prior to uh, 2020. Uh, and 
So that's always a possibility and that if we need to, we can go through and, and start up another program using loss mitigation funds. But for the moment, uh, the plans are to uh, continue to simply use the FEMA funds. For CEA Brace and Bolt, the, the funding comes from CEA itself, and we plan on doing uh, up to 3,500 uh, uh, retrofits through CEA. And for Earthquake Brace and Bolt, it says up to 2,000 on this slide, but it's actually, for 2020, it's actually twice that. I can find my cursor here. There we go. These photos are just to give you an example. This is from Napa from the 2016 earthquake. Um, just to give you an idea of what it is that we're trying to prevent. Uh, this house uh, had cripple walls. You can see not particularly tall cripple walls. Uh, and it um, toppled off of its foundation and was um, not livable for a fair amount of time. I believe this is one of the ones that was uh, not, uh, they were not able to get back into their home for a couple of years. Uh, you can see that, it, you know, it's pulled away from the steps uh, there to get you know, out of the house on the top right. Uh, so, I mean, with this kind of movement, this kind of damage, uh, it's very dangerous just even getting in and out of the house. Uh, but there's also the potential for it to have uh, broken gas lines, water lines, uh, which create significant dangers uh, of their own. But then on top of that, you have the 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 problem of you, how do you put your life back together? How do you uh, start planning what your next steps are when your very next step has to be well? How do I get a roof over my head? Because I can't. We're you know we're not going to be able to stay here. Uh, the more people we can keep in their homes and uh, have the ability to sort of start putting the pieces back together in their own home rather than first having to find some place to stay and then figure out what they're going to do with their homes, uh, the better communities will be able to get back up on their feet much, much quicker if they're able, you know, people are able to stay in their homes uh, and then start putting pieces back together there. This is just to give you an idea of what we've um, experienced with uh, the retrofit program, Northern California versus Southern California. Uh, this includes the pilot program in 2013, uh, and then all the way up through last year, through December 31st of last year. You can see uh, significantly more Retrofit's done in Southern California than Northern California, and if you go down and look at the average cost, you can have a pretty good idea as to why. Uh, the, the difference in cost typically is mostly labor. There is some difference in uh, materials we found, but the more significant difference um, tends to be in labor. Uh, the average cost uh, you know, factors in, when you look at the minimum and maximum costs at the very bottom. You can see those maximum costs are like 75,000 and 54,000. Uh, those are uh, big foundation replacement engineered uh, type retrofits that skew the average uh, you know, quite a bit. Uh, so that's why I really like to look at the median cost because that gives you the center point. You know, 50% of uh, the retrofits in Northern California are above that $6,954 mark, and half of them are below it, whereas in Southern California, it's a $4,000 mark, which is the midway point. So half half or more than that, half or less. The program highlights, our program cycle for EBB is typically a year with registration periods open uh, for 30 days. Uh, the Registration period also typically is usually somewhere between the end of January, starting at the end of January or beginning of February, uh, and then it runs for 30 days from that point. We have uh, varied from that on occasion, uh, but that is the most typical piece. It's usually 
toward the end of January, middle of February, uh, that we begin it and then it runs for 30 days. Uh, for 2019, uh, we did have some funding available and where I said that loss mitigation fund uh, amount. For 2019, we did have a program that used money from the loss mitigation fund, but we also had some FEMA funds. For 2020, it's gonna be all FEMA funds. And for the EBV program, like I said, because of that FEMA requirement, they have to be uh, on our directory since that FEMA trained contractors list, uh, or they can be do-it-yourselfers. Uh, the, the plan sets are done in such a way, Chapter 83 is done in such a way so that um, do-it-yourselfers can do it. For CEABB, it's selected CEA policyholders, so there's no registration period uh, timeframe. Uh, and the the program cycle isn't the same. It can it can run for more than one year, really, until we get uh, up to that, till we meet our goal of the number of retrofits uh, that we have uh, money available for at that point. And then that program would close down, and we could conceivably open another one. Uh, the funding again is CEA only, and then a licensed general building contractor or a do-it-yourselfer. Uh, can do it here. Like I said, they don't have to be on the, the directory, uh, but that resource is available for them if they want. Uh, homeowners, this is one of the issues with the program, is that homeowners can't obtain a permit before they're accepted in the program. In this case, registration isn't acceptance. It, registration is simply they're registered for the program, but we have to actually accept them into the program for them to start and to get the permit. Um, it's the same thing, they can't start work, can't get the permit, do any of that stuff until they're accepted. Then once they are, they can move forward and start doing that. Uh, and again, both programs provide uh, up to $3,000 for a code compliant retrofit. This is the contractor directory that I was talking about. Uh, homeowners can go in, they can put in the zip code and then give us a radius of where they want to search. And uh, it will bring up search results for them to be able to choose from uh, if they don't uh, have you know an idea of where to go to look for a contractor. Like I said, for EBB, they have to pull off of this list. But even if they know somebody who isn't on this directory, but they would like to use them, they can always suggest to that person that they get on the directory, and once they're on it, then they can choose them. There's no, it's like a not, not a, a waiting period or anything that they'd have to go through. So once that contractor's on the directory, they would be able to use them. But if they really don't know where to go and they just need uh, a resource to be able to find a contractor for themselves, um, this is a great resource. The search comes up, it's random. So each time they search, the order is gonna be different uh, so there's no, just because somebody's uh, business name starts with a number or a name, they're not always going to pop up as the first result. Uh, each time you do that, the, the results are going to be mixed uh, and different. Uh, I think, I can't stress it enough though, this is a service. It's not an endorsement or an approval of any contractor. Uh, so people tend to have a tendency to think because it's this directory that somehow they're associated with us and they're not, they're independent businesses. They run their businesses how they see fit. Uh, the only thing here is uh, they've taken a test that allows them to be on this directory and this directory is there as a resource for homeowners to be able to find uh, somebody to do the work. So this is what we need from you. Uh, we need the, the permit, scope of work or description to state that the retrofit is in accordance with either the LA City Standard Plan number one or Standard Plan set A, uh, or that the retrofit is per engineered plans in accordance with chapter A3. And it could also say that the retrofit is uh, in accordance with chapter A3 without the engineered plans piece of it if uh, 
if they happen to not use either one of the plan sets and just worked off of chapter A3. We don't see that very often, but on occasion we do. Uh, so that wording for us is crucial because uh, our expectation is that uh, the inspector that's going out to inspect will inspect to those standards. Uh, that's what they're looking for. And uh, we base our really our program on that, on that trust that this is being looked at and that's the standard to which it's being held. Um, and because of that, uh, final inspections are required uh, to show that that work is being done as described above and that uh, we reserve the right to pull the programs out of any particular city uh, if we find out that that's not uh, what's taking place. Uh, you know, luckily, Knockwood, we really haven't had um, that situation come up, but uh, but every so often, um, especially with new cities coming in, the wording on the permit can uh, sometimes be troublesome at the beginning until we can, you know, end up getting things worked out. Because there's, you know, obviously numerous people working front desks, and everybody has their own way uh, of doing something. But for our program, like Janiel was talking about the legacy of the voluntary retrofit before, um, where it sort of was anything goes and the wording for those particular retrofits um, wasn't. Oh, I don't know what the right wording here is here, but there wasn't anything specific that needed to be said on those because the they weren't working toward a code. But our program in particular requires that the work be done in accordance with Chapter Eight Three, and so either one of those plan sets. Uh, works for that. Uh, so that's why it's very, very important for us that that's the language that's in there. We have websites, earthquakebracebolt.com and cebracebolt.com. You can tell very similar. Uh, really almost anything uh, you'd want to know about the program is in there somewhere. There is a lot of information. Uh, there's a section there for building departments where you can get to, and it will take you to this page, which uh, gives you access to the the FEMA education course, the, the the one that we have the contractors take. the The quiz isn't with it, but the, the actual course is there. You can go through um, and see what it is that they're um, being asked to do. Uh, we also have links to the LA City Standard Plan and Plan Set A. Uh, and then a little video that gives you an idea of sort of what we're looking for uh, and uh, what we're trying to prevent uh, with this type of uh, retrofit. As I just mentioned, cebracebolt.com, uh, no plus in between the brace and the bolt. Uh, also, earthquakebracebolt.com, uh, you get almost any information you want. We also have ebbtools.com, uh, where uh, contractors generally will get postcards uh, where it can be customized with their logo and return address. Um, but this PowerPoint will be available there. Uh, you can also get flyers for your counters that are available there, sample press releases, uh, and social media su suggested posts. Uh, can be obtained obtained from there. It's all for free, uh, and uh, yeah, you just need to go to ebbtools.com and you can uh, get any of those if you need them. Well, this is uh, the end here. Uh, we have contact information if you need to get in touch with us. This is my direct. Email address mgrissom at calquake.com. Uh, so, like we said here, if there was something that, that as we we're going through you wanted to ask, or you have something that uh, you that comes up later on that you want to ask about, you can get in touch with me at that email address. But if you should lose my email address, if you can just remember the info at and then cebracebolt.com or earthquakebracebolt.com, uh, 
Uh, we're really a very small group here, so you can email them. Anybody here should be able to answer almost any question that you have, but uh, you can always just get it to me by putting attention mark, uh, and uh, they'll make sure that I get it. Uh, and I think that is it. I was There was something else that I was going to go over, but since I can't remember it, I'm just going to say we're we're done for the for this particular one. Janelle, was there anything else that you wanted to uh, to say? Yeah, well, in addition to saying thank you very much, I wanted to just uh, kind of reiterate one thing about the 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 language on the code and why that's so important is when we go after funding, one of the things we hear from uh, particularly from government entities is how big is the problem? And uh, if you were to go back and, and have access to all the data, at every building department in the state, it would be difficult to assess who has really had their house retrofitted properly because the language has, has had so much variance. And so that's why we really, really push for the, the language to be um, in accordance with and then have one of those those documents or chapter A3 is that, you know, in the future, we'd like homeowners to be able to use their building departments as a reference reference to check their house, check a house they're interested in buying to see if the house was properly retrofitted so that they can check that off of, of their list. So once again, we really appreciate your participation. And if you have any questions, we are here for you and here for your staff. Thank you so much. Oh, and I, you know what I did remember. Uh, what it was that I wanted to say, because it was just really to to reiterate something you had said earlier about uh, the building department being um, really our partner and and how we don't really tell them how to deal with or do anything in particular with the uh, how they interpret the, the plan sets or chapter A3. Uh, we leave it up to them to be able to do that. So when we get any technical questions from homeowners or contractors about how we interpret the plan set or how we interpret something from chapter A3, we will always be returning them back to uh, the building department. All right, that's it. Thank you for uh, attending, and uh, I will stop our recording right now. Thank you.